Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast. It is Monday evening when we're recording this, so it's the start of another busy week, having just experienced a busy weekend all across Europe. My name is your host, Chris, and I've got two of my three-man crew with me this evening. Once again, I welcome back Drew and John. Good evening, sirs. Evening. Afternoon, my cheeky darlings. Ah, yes, afternoon view, Drew. I always forget <laughs> you live in a different country entirely to the one I live in. Um, no and our English evening. is worse. Yeah, true. <laughs> no Tom this evening as uh, he's got some work commitments, so um, we wish Tom well, and I'm sure he will return soon. Uh, he's not dead, by the way. It sounded like he was dead. We wish him well. Christ. Um, Tom will be back with us soon once, uh, once work gets sorted out. So uh, I will be handling La Liga this evening, so God help everybody who's a fan of Spanish football. I will do my best. However, um, this week we're going to start in France. So let's get straight over to it as I hand over to John for this week's Liga. Right, Liga this week. Uh, we'll start with a, well, I suppose, nice, easy, comfortable game for PSG away to Montpellier, Chris. Yeah, or not. Uh, surprise. Very surprising, this one. It, it ended in a victory for Montpellier, which I suppose, in theory, you could say is, is not a huge shock, given that Montpellier are usually pretty good at home. And uh, it was on French TV and it, it was the big game on the Saturday. They could write, raise their game, etc. But Montpellier came into the game lower half of the table, um, mixed form, two draws and a defeat in their last three coming into this one. They uh, they won by three goals to nil at the uh, Stade de la Mousson, and and they deserved it as well. They kind of set up in a a three five one one formation almost. So the three centre backs with the, the two full backs, um, Lasner and and Walter Remy um, on the uh, on the right hand on the right hand side, and. It was actually Lazla that got the opening goal um, with uh, an assist from Mune, who's, uh, who's really doing well, actually, the, the new centre forward they've got there. I say new, the one who's broken through this year after Kazimir Inga's injury. He put them one in front on the 42nd minute, so just before the break. And then straight after the break, Skiri, who's uh, also started to come good recently, converted from Morgan Samson's assist to make it 2 0 after 48 minutes. And, uh, and Riyad Budabu's curling in a, a beauty for the uh, clinching cherry on the icing on the cake in the 80th minute. And a 3 0 demolition job was complete. Uh, PSG back in this 4 3 3 formation. Um, I'll just run you quickly through this lineup Aurier, Marquinhos, Thiago Silva, Kazawa, uh, and Cuckoo. Uh, yeah, I know that's his name. Uh, Krejciak, uh, Metwidi, Lucas, Le- uh, Lucas Silva, and uh, Cavani and Di Maria. I mean, it's not a bad lineup, is it? It's sorry, Lucas Moore, not Lucas Silva. It's not a, not a bad lineup, is it? it? It's a pretty strong PSG lineup, and they were just completely outthought, outplayed, outbattled. A few had really poor performances. Um, Marquinhos and Thiago Silva looked decidedly shaky at the back. Uh, Di Maria was still not at his his best. Cavani. Didn't miss too many chances because he didn't get too many chances. In fact, he was subbed uh, late on for Augustin. Uh, Hesse was also brought off the bench, but to no avail. So it's, it's a very good result for Montpellier. It's not the ideal preparation for PSG ahead of their crucial Champions League game in midweek against Luda Goretz. You would expect them to win that even with half a side. Maybe they had an eye on that game, possibly. But uh, when we come on to other results a little bit later on, um, it's not the game they wanted to lose this because they are now quite far off the pace. We definitely have a title race in France. Yeah, I I saw some highlights of this game. Um, Marquinhos in particular looked really poor, which is surprising considering how highly rated he is. And um, as good as Buda Booz's strike uh, was for his goal, um, I've got to say Ariola made a right tit of himself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. He got down very slowly, didn't he? Mm. he? It's one of those where he sort of dove before the ball got there, and he couldn't reach out a hand. So, yeah, it's a lovely strike. But like you say, the keeper's uh, got to be questioned. And when you got Kevin Trapp on the bench, um, who himself wasn't great, which is what got Ariel in in the first place. Um, like you say, it's uh, it's 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 under pressure for him to keep his place now. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that joke. Just had oh, to let that one slip. See, I didn't even say yeah. nipple before I said. Oh, dear, never mind. Right, oh, we'll very move good. On. 
move on. Um, <laughs> uh, Bordeaux, Lille. Um, Bordeaux, uh, been fairly decent this season. Um, we're at home for Lille. Um, surprise result for Lille winning this one, Lille? Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, we I know we did Lille last week, but I wanted to focus on them again this week for two reasons, really. One, because I've successfully converted our uh, our co-host, the English Breakfast, Ross, into following Liga. So we've kind of traded leagues. I'm I'm watching a lot more championship these days, and he's now, uh, he's calling League We, uh, Le- he's calling Lille We now. So he's properly invested in, in Project Lille. So, um, yeah, I wanted to pick them out for the second time because th- there's been a bit of turmoil at, at Lille recently in that they they've got uh, Patrick Collot is their uh, is their interim coach at the moment when Antonetti left which I should say happened during the the week I was I was off sick shall we say so we we never really go for that much coverage on the podcast but after uh, after he left Collard has come in and he's not a big name you know he's promoted from within and and he's doing a fairly steady job there's a lot of talks that uh, a man you'll know well John uh, Marcelo Bielsa um, is is the man that uh, that the the Lille hierarchy want in charge uh, it's all part of this sort of rebranding of Lille and you know making them a, a new force in, in Liga and really bringing them back to the, the the heady days when they were winning titles they are one of one of uh, Liga's longest um, or most historic clubs and they have got a serious history behind them of, of winning titles but this result was much needed and and Collot has just slowly got them improving um, it's two wins and a draw in the last five in the last three now so I'm beaten in three games and a win away at Bordeaux. It's it's never an easy place to go. Um, although Bordeaux did miss a penalty, it has to be added um, in this game. You, you do have to say that Diego Roland's penalty was saved in the 73rd minute. But they uh, they got the winning goal. Uh, Nicolas de Preville with the uh, with the winning goal. And uh, it's a very, very good point, uh, or very, very good three points, I should say, for Lille. And they are just steadily moving up the table. Um, and it would be good to see them climb this table even at the expense of uh, clubs like I might support potentially but um, it'll be very very interesting to see what happens with this Bielsa stuff because if he comes in uh, you know what it's like it's all blood and thunder to start with and uh, it usually ends badly so if he was to come in in say January and just have a run at it to the end of the season and I wonder how high they could finish so we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that one yeah good news for Ross um, and moving on to our last game to uh, cover in depth uh, Inform Ren uh, hosted Saint Etienne, and yet again another home win. Yes, absolutely. Our uh, our friend and uh, colleague Rich Allen will be a happy man because uh, Ren at home are great. Ren away are not so great, but they're up to fourth. I think it's probably fair to say that. Well, I think it's fair to say anyway that they won't end up in the uh, in the Champions League spots. I think that's a step too far for Ren. But if you'd have said at this stage of the season. Uh, coming into the winter break nearly upon us that they will be fourth. I think they'd gladly take that. And uh, Rosan Park, they are very, very decent. And they were again today. St Etienne, traditionally poor travellers. Um, they're, they're on a bit of an alarming slider form as well. Just one win in the last five themselves. But uh, it's a comfortable 2-0 win for for Ren. Pa- uh, Paul George and Tapu's back to uh, near enough fitness anyway. He uh, he got the opener on 54 minutes. And Kamil Grzycki, the, um, the eternal substitute, bless him, uh, popped up with a 90 minute clincher to uh, to get the points but um, yeah Renner, Renner in some decent form at the moment and they've got some some decent young players as well and uh, I think it, I think a lot of it with Ren is can they correct this away form if they can then who knows how high they could finish but I think if you said to them now you'll finish top six they'd be delighted with that so uh, fair play to Ren and um, as for St Etienne Europa League may be their priority at the moment but the way they're playing they won't last very long in that either yeah, the um, it's got to be said as well. If you haven't seen the Grzycki goal, um, go and look it up. Uh, he did mean yes. it. It's yeah, absolutely ridiculous. I, I have no idea how he pulled that off. <laughs> Meaning, and he's got that in his locker. That's the weird thing. He's, yeah. he's a weird, he's a weird player because you know people who saw him for Poland in the in the Euros, you know he's a very very technically good player, um, and he always seems to, to provide something in a game of uh, you know worth looking back on but he doesn't start a lot of games so I don't know whether it's a fitness thing or a mentality thing but the, the talent is there and whoever does end up picking him up because I don't think he'll stay at Ren in this role for much longer I think he'll uh, he'll do a good job for them yeah it's uh, you can't even really describe it so definitely go check that out um, do you want to run through the rest of the results um, one of which uh, we'll leave out because you're going to talk about it in the news 
Yes, indeed. Yes. So uh, Friday night, we had a bit of a thriller, actually. Khan 3, Dijon 3. Did not see this coming. I've got to be honest. I expected this to be a, a very horrible nil-nil. But uh, Santini with two and uh, Caramo for Khan, or for Khan, I should say. Uh, Lise Melo, Dioni, uh, the young lad I like, and an own goal from Bessat. Got the goals for Dijon, who were actually down to 10 men after the 31st minute. So very, very credi- creditable point for them. Uh, given the circumstances, I would suggest a uh, good good point there. Um, Lorient uh, got some point or got a point again this week. Happy days once again. Couldn't hold a lead. Standard. Uh, Sylvain Marveau, Newcastle fans probably won't remember, but he played for them once. He put uh, Lorient in front, but Jeju and then Doi put Ange, uh, for Ange back in front two one. But uh, Waris equalised in the 66th minute. Monaco went goal crazy once again. Five goals for Monaco again. They are just incredible at the moment uh killian mbappe got the opener uh tom lamar with a goal himself uh Carrillo Ooh, with the that late was a very good goal wasn't it Lamar's. it was yeah i was yeah. gonna say that's another one you want to look up um and two more for uh lesser spotted el tigre radamel falcao um back to a uh, form for him so five nil there gangomp beat nod two nil the curious case of nod continues um i don't think it's going to be very long before we have an announcement from nod uh, we're, we're waiting for it the uh the, the sacking of rene girard don't think it's going to be very long before that happens uh, if it hasn't happened at time of recording uh brion and salibur with the goals there um and finally the sunday games marseille winning 3-11 nancy tovan gomis and ng that's almost an ex-Premier League uh, score list there, isn't it? Well, it is, in fact. Um, and Nice beat Toulouse by three goals to nil. Ali Player, Yunus uh, Belanda and uh, Jean-Michel Serri with the uh, three goals there. Nice are back on top of Liga. Oh, lovely stuff. Um, now, the game we didn't mention um, because there was a suspension of the game. Uh, it did start, it just didn't get to finish. So do you want to fill us in what happened between Metz and Lyon, Chris? Yes, if um, if anyone hasn't seen this, I'd be surprised because it's been all over social media and, and whatnot news outlets this week. But yeah, Mets were hosting um, Inform Leon and uh, they went 1-0 up through uh, Gautier Ian, who's um, a young player who's, who's just come in and, and all of a sudden sort of started um, getting some time on the pitch from it's come through the Mets youth ranks. And he scored an absolutely blinding goal. Um, I don't know whether you, you, I'm sure you can find it somewhere, even though the game is technically suspended. Um, it's a beautiful curling strike from about 25 yards out into the the top bin Um, and everything's great or so it seems uh, except the Mets fans decided that that was the ideal opportunity to uh, to throw firecrackers at uh, Anthony Lopez in the Leon goal Um, and unfortunately for him and indeed for Mets and their supporters ruined the game because it was then suspended for a period of 35 minutes um, where Anthony Lopez was actually taken to hospital and there's a very very good picture of the image uh, of the incident sorry that came out on social media where you can clearly see the firecracker exploding right by his face um and uh, and he goes down and I, I believe it was he was classed as sound trauma i believe is what he was treated for but either way it, it's it's ridiculous it's utterly nonsensical um i can't see any way that mets will i would it's very difficult the, the french fa are quite strong on punishments i would not be at all surprised to see there be the stadium ban or points um, points removed from their their table and when you're a club like mets you can't afford to lose points um, so it's absolutely crackers. The game will be replayed at some point. We don't know when, uh, but yeah, just just an absolutely crackers set of circumstances. Yeah, uh, very stupid um, and disappointing as well for the other Mets fans as well because it's obviously just one or two individuals that have done it and ruined the game. And um, yeah, just yeah. not a lot you can say about it really. But yeah, I'm sure yeah. everyone has seen it. Um, do you just want to give us the table then before we hand over to the next section? Yes, absolutely. So Nice are back on top with their 3-0 win. They are three points clear of Monaco, who are second now on 36 points. Uh, PSG down in third, 35 points. So four points off the uh, off the top. Ren, as we mentioned, a fourth with Gangomp, Lyon, Bordeaux and Toulouse making up the top eight. And Etienne and Marseille are the other two in the top half of the table. And then down at the bottom, Lorient is still bottom. Yeah, we know. 12 points. Uh, it is getting a bit closer, though. 13 points, Nantes, second bottom, Bastia. Third bottom in the relegation playoff spot now on 14, Can 15, Nancy and Dijon 16, Lille and Metz 17 and 18, with Montpellier and Angers making up the top, uh, the bottom 10. Sorry, so it's all getting rather close as we uh, fast approach the winter break. Yeah, still good to see there's a title race on and uh, three teams in it as well, which is nice because uh, you know PSG getting back in there, getting some form again. Um, although they did obviously lose this week, but um, I expect them to bounce back fine. Uh, just exciting okay. to watch Liga for a change. 
Indeed. Oh, for a change, you cheeky bugger. <laughs> yes, anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, Liga uh, for this week, so I'll we'll uh, hand it back over to you, Chris. OK, good stuff. So we'll uh, we'll move on then to uh, our next port of call, which this week is we're off to Germany and it's the Bundesliga. Right then, Drew. Uh, lots of uh, exciting action in the Bundesliga this weekend, as usual. And we're going to start with um, a club close to my heart. Uh, that'll be Freiburg, uh, mainly for one of their um, one of their players. But I, I kind of used to like their kit. So, yeah, I know, kit love <laughs> once again. But uh, uh, they got a very creditable point in an away match at Leverkusen, who, fair to say, are stuttering somewhat at the moment. Yeah, no, it's... Um... I feel sorry for Jimmy in advance. Uh, I apologize for the weekend. You know, our, our good friend Jimmy is a big lover who's supported him, and I've had discussions about it. But this was a, one of the ones where Roger Schmidt's going to be not too happy. I think that at the end of the day, Leverkusen deserved all three points, to be honest. Um, you know, it was a bit of an even match, but I think Leverkusen had the better chances. You know, they, they controlled the match as you would expect them to at home. Um, but, you know, Farber can be a little bit tricky at times. You know, Chris, I know you've seen a little bit of them this season, but um, <clears throat> they don't score very many goals. Um, they're not in form at the moment. Actually, they, they've lost three on the spin before that performance in Leverkusen. You know, they also weren't in picking form coming into it. They, they lost their last two before winning the first two previously. So it was one of those ones where Leverkusen needed to use it to get back on track. And seemingly with Freiburg out of form, you would expect that they that they would they would show up. But they you know they went one 0 down. I'm going to mention Yannick Haber opened the scoring and the Hakenshaw knew leveled matters in 60 minutes, but it just wasn't going to be enough. Um, you know, they did actually have a chance. You know, Chicharito had um, <laughs> his penalty saved <laughs> late on in the match. And you that would have been the right result had he have converted it. But, you know, yet again, it just wasn't their day. Um, and it's just it, it, questions now are going to be, well, you know, this is not the Leverkusen that we saw, especially the second half of last season, where, you know, for me, they're one of the most bright attacking teams in the Bundesliga, again, they're just they're a little bit struggle bug right now. So it's uh, again, it's one of those things where it's not, you know, it's not a complete loss for them. Uh, a lot of teams can come back in the Wakanda and have an excellent second half of the season and really turn the tables around for themselves. But in Leverkusen, they're certainly capable. But for me, again, it's just one of those teams where uh, there's definitely more questions right now um, than answers. And uh, Jimmy got his wish. Uh, Jagovic, you know, actually started the match. He he played brilliantly. Um, but uh, and uh, Kevin Campbell is someone who I mean I just spoke about previously. And I thought that you know Kevin Campbell he's he's been pretty solid this season. But for a player who came to the Bundesliga as a wide player, then shifted to that more central role, maybe being creative from from middle, maybe a little bit deeper. He started long Charles Aaron Gies, and I didn't think that Campbell was all that fantastic. I just I don't know. Um, maybe still Lucas is suffering for a little bit of an imbalance. Maybe you could say, but. Um, Apart from that, you know, they just they need, they need to get they're really missing future those goals, and we have said that the previous weeks, and and showed he had a chance to to get one to the, uh, the weekend and it didn't happen. So we'll see how it goes from there. But still, they haven't been great. So we'll see if they turn it around. Yeah, we will keep an eye. And uh, um, for, I'm, I know everybody is dying to know Vincenzo Grifo is the player I have a little bit of a soft spot for. Just really like of him. Of course he is. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a good little he's, player. To, to be fair, he's actually been very, very good. He's been one of the best left-sided players throughout the season from first match to now. And he always seems, you know, when he's on, Freiburg usually get a result. And he's definitely been excellent. So we'll see if he can if he can crack his way into a national team setup sometime in the next year or two. But he's been great. Good shot for that. True that, true that. And I, th- I think he's uh, Italian. Yeah, he is Italian, isn't he? Yeah, so he's Italian German. So he has eligibility dual passports. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. tug of war. Do you like a tug of war? <laughs> okay, so that's uh, those two clubs looked after. Then our second game, um, Hoffenheim. Um, they played host to FC Köln, who have and themselves had a, a brilliant uh, first half of the season. But um, Nagelsmann again, his boys just blew them away four 0 it's, um, 
you could, for me, you could really boil this down to who took their chances. Um, and who didn't, you know, chances were, were dead even. Um, come 90 minutes, they either, both sides only carved out 10, but Leverkusen converted four of them, and one of them came early. Sandro Wagner opened scoring on seven minutes, and with the form that Hoffenheim are in at right now and the confidence that, they're, that they have in their play, you would have to imagine that if, if you go 1-0 up at home with how well that they're playing and um, so the work that they put in for each other and the system that they all understand, you have to assume that they were going to win. I didn't expect 4-0 considering um, how good uh, Cole have been defensively under Peter Stoger. I, I would expect them to, you know, if, if they were going to go ahead and lose, I would say... You know what would have been acceptable, and you and I spoke about this during the weekend. That neither of us expected um, them to surrender four. Uh, if you look at it up to that point, <laughs> before that match, they only they had only allowed eight goals in twelve matches, and now they have allowed twelve and thirteen. So it's just sometimes you have a bad day at the office defensively. I think this was this was that day. I, I you really can't point out any player for Cole who really turned up. And I think that's also one of the bigger problems. Um, Jonas Hector, you could say Jonas Hector maybe did pretty all right. Um, but again, as I've highlighted before, when Anthony Modeste doesn't score, Cole are going to struggle. And and they, they, may, they may still have lost, even if he did find a goal that game. But, you know, one goal can change everything. So if, you know, Hoffenheim go 2-0 up on 30 minutes when Jeremy Tolian scored. But So say, for example, if Modeste scored and made it 2-1. You know, when, when your striker can turn up and get you a goal in a tough spot, sometimes momentum can shift and you can maybe dig out a result or at least sort of lessen the damage suffered, but it just wasn't meant to be. So for me, this kind of highlights that one of those things where when they can't find ways to make Modesto the threat that he is and then have him being focused on, even if he doesn't score, it opens up space for other people and it just was one of those days where neither of those things happened. You know, you can give Colin credit for you know how hard they did they did defend well you know they they put it they were good in the tackle as usual um but when hoffenheim they have a way of just converting their chances this season and you know they do average i think top five in, in the Bundesliga in shots taken per 90 minutes and so they, they're, they're just they're just creating the space that they need um and again you see the likes of you know, um nathan mamiri played very very well um, Sandra Wagner again did, did very well and that, that seems like the back three under Nagelsmann has really given Hoffenheim the freedom to go forward and express themselves in further areas and something you didn't see from them before that he really showed up and it just makes such a big difference and you, you really can't stop saying positive things about it so it's another good performance from them and uh, with that result they're uh, up to fourth and they're only two points back of Hertha who are in third so the dream continues for them but uh, people shouldn't really worry about Cologne at the moment. You know, it's just a, a hiccup, and, and they have lost recently. But you know, there are the two previous losses was a two-one away loss to Hertha and a one-nil uh, away loss against Eintracht Frankfurt. So uh, you could say that maybe they don't really perform well on the road. All three of their losses this season come away from home, but so it's not all doing good for them yet. But Hoffenheim are excellent, and they're still undefeated. Yeah, well said, well said. And speaking of teams that had a bad day at the office, that brings us nicely <laughs> on to uh, Wolfsburg, who've well, they've not had a bad day at the office. They've had a bad office of the season. I mean, they've just been two seasons. They weren't two, great last year. Yeah, three, that's either. a good point. Yeah, fair point. Um, now we'll, we'll touch on some of the players in a second, but they uh, they lost again. It's another home defeat, and this time by three goals to two, and a bit of a thriller with uh, Hersa, who themselves are having a, a top quality season so far. It's oof. Uh, <laughs> when I when we spoke again, we 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 had a little chit chat about this on WhatsApp. You know, if this was and two seasons ago, not last season, but the season previous, you know, when both work was still performing pretty well, if you would say that they would have blown a two one lead at home and surrendered a penalty kick in in stoppage time, you, you would have actually said that was probably nuts. You know, this is it's not the same Wolfsburg from two years ago. Um, and as we just commented before. Um, they have some internal issues as well now with, you know, like that, you know, Julian Jackson had, so Julian Jackson has come out and said that he wants to leave. The fans are not receiving him well at the moment. Um, a lot of their key players just aren't performing. And you have to now ask yourself, is this because some of the players just don't want to be there? Is it just a, a, a dressing room breakdown on the whole? Are there issues with Flair and Ishmael? You know, it's, it's now, for me, it looks like a multifaceted problem as to why both just aren't performing. And especially because they've, over the last couple of seasons, they have been so good at home, especially. Um, and, you know, you have to give Hertha credit for coming back, obviously, but um, 
despite even though Wolfsburg surrendered the, the, the two late goals um, in the last 20 minutes, they still didn't really play very well. So you could almost say that Hertha actually deserved the win, and they almost didn't get it. You know, I think Wolfsburg only created eight chances um, through 90 minutes, and apart from that, Hertha were dominant. So um, it was an early shootout. You know, um, Mayor opened the scoring on 12 minutes, and Marvin Plattenhart leveled on 16, and then uh, Paul Sagan scored on, on the 18th, and then it I was an S fine tied up in six nine minutes, and then the late penalty happened in 91. So when you see that kind of performance, when when a team isn't playing well and and confidence is down, and you're up to one, and you can't go on and improve your performance throughout 90 minutes when you have a lead in front of your home ground and you allow a team to dominate you at home and then go on and win, that's a sign that there are big issues. Um, and I think the Jackson issue is just one of many. Um, you know, you could say that maybe technically they haven't been good, which they haven't. You know, as I said before, their players haven't really been performing, which they really haven't. But for me, it's just, they're just a complete mess at the moment. Um, and for a team who have been recently as good as they have been, to see them down 15 points, only two clear of relegation, that's just, you know, at this point, you can almost throw your hands up and say they need like a complete reworking almost to maybe get back on track. And that's clear that's not even really possible, but... Worrying signs for them, but credit for Hertha. You know, they got the three points that they did deserve. And with that, you know, as I said before, Hertha are still in the running as they were last year, early doors to, to maybe make a push for Champions League. So It's hard to see where the Wolfsburg project comes up next, isn't it? And, uh, no clue. Yeah, we may well, um, <laughs> if, if we get time, we may touch on that a little bit more in the question section. But we'll, uh, we'll leave them there for a moment. And uh, let's get the other results from the weekend's action. Sure. On Friday, Bayern went to Mainz in the 1-3-1. Uh, Dortmund, sorry, John. Dortmund hosted Gladbach on Saturday in 1-4-1. Uh, Werder Bremen actually won 2-1 at home against the uh, bottom dwellers in Wolfstad, which is unfortunate to see considering their, you know, how decently they performed last season. Uh, Every Leipzig kept winning. They won 2-1 at home to Schalke, and they're still top on the table. Uh, Hamburg actually traveled to Darmstadt and actually won, so they're no longer at the bottom of the table. And then uh, Augsburg hosted Eintracht Frankfurt and drew 1-1. Interesting. And where does that leave us on the table after all those results? Well, as I said before, uh, RBL are top on 33 points. Bayern second on 30. Hertha third on 27. Uh, Hoffenheim and Frankfurt tied for fourth on 25. And Dortmund is in sole possession of sixth place on 24 points. So they're they're climbing back up. You know, maybe making a push for that championship spot that they might feel they deserve. Uh, Ingolstadt bottom uh, six points on 18th. Hamburg 17th on seven points. Darmstadt 16th on eight points. Wolfsburg 15th on 10, and then Werder Bremen are 14th on 11 points. All getting close as we head uh, close mm-hmm. to that winter break. And a uh, little bit of news that it involves a certain Borussia Dortmund centre forward. Oh, good God. Well, there's two bits of news. Well, as I alluded to before, uh, Jaxer come out and he reiterated the fact that he wants to leave the club. Uh, for those of you who listen to the pod who are Arsenal fans, um, I'm, I know you're going to be the first one to jump at the chance to want to get Julian Jackson in the club, but um, they won't be the only suitors, but for me, it seems like if he's just not happy, and it's, it seems to be causing some sort of issue that he just needs to go, I, mean, I think it's better for the club and for him. I honestly don't know if he really wanted to go there to begin with in the first place from Schalke, when he moved from Schalke, so maybe a bit better for him to go. And then in regards to Pierre Marco Bamiang, now he's come out and said that he could see himself leaving Dortmund at the end of the season. Um, you know, I'll have to do a little bit more digging, but, you know, before the pod, I was doing a little bit of research on the news, and he said that, you know, he he said he didn't know if he would stay. You know, he recognized the fact that he's in excellent form playing football right now. He's, I think he's second or third in Europe in goals, um, but he just can't guarantee that he would stay. Um, and when someone says something like that, when in the form that they're in, um, Dortmund have had a little bit of the struggles this year. You know, he is linked with City again, and Pep Guardiola, everyone knows how much you know Pep admires him. So um, you can almost see that maybe happening, and it's just one of those things where you have to ask yourself, if Dortmund go ahead and sell him, you know, have Dortmund, you can't really say have Dortmund become a selling club, but it really makes people think that Dortmund really are not at that top level, that, you know, they're right below it where players can come into Dortmund and, and if they can't provide it longevity, it's Dortmund's just going to be one of those open-door policies with them from moving forward, and it's pretty difficult to come to grips with. 
Yeah, it is, uh, it is a bit of a tough one that on Dortmund, but I think we all kind of guessed that uh, maybe he wouldn't be around mm. for much longer this season. We shall watch that with close eyes. OK, um, right, we'll leave Bundesliga there for the time being then. Um, I should actually ask you, because I didn't do it myself, uh, if you have a game to watch next week. Oh, good grief. Uh, <laughs> actually, I thought about it before and I completely forgot. Uh, give me five seconds to... Oh, it's actually the um, on Friday... Um, Frankfurt host Hoffenheim. Uh, they're level on points for fourth, so that's got some interesting um, connotations. Yes, there you go. I can't, <laughs> that's I can't, a good I can't, one, I can't think today, but yeah, it's it's whoever wins that is in sole possession of fourth and could potentially jump up to third, depending on uh, Hertha's result. And they host Werder Bremen at home, so it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, I think that that would be the one. I shall probably watch that because I do like the Eagles. I must admit, I, uh, I've been really enjoying Frankfurt, especially, obviously, there's a bit of an Alex Meyer fetish there, but I still like watching them play. So, um, I like to remind us every week. I know. That, that <laughs> goal, was it uh, Chris Sinovich, is it his name, I think? He got for them at Gate. Yeah, really, mm-hmm. really good goal this weekend. So, yeah. yeah, I do like them. Their third kit's rather nice as well. I know, kits again. Okay, um, I should say, of course, um, if anyone's looking for a game to watch in France next week, it's obvious PSG Nice. Um, I, I forgot to mention mine, so I'll just chuck that one in there uh, Sunday night. So, yeah, definitely watch that. Should be a cracker. Right, okay, we'll leave uh, Germany slash brief bit of France there, and we're going to go off to Italy next and see what's been going on in John's neck of the woods. It's this week's Serie A. Okay then, John. So, what has been going on in Serie A this weekend? Well, the first game we, uh, of course, have to highlight. There was a a rather large game in Rome this weekend. So, were the colours red slash burgundy slash whatever the colour that is? Or were they sky blue? Uh, They were red slash burgundy slash whatever colour it is. And they were also uh, brand new colours as well, because it was a specially commissioned kit just for the derby. It's a beauty, Um, isn't it? Yeah, oh. even even has special track shoot jackets as well, which are very 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 nice. Um, but yeah, Rome Rome are one two nil, but um, doesn't tell the story of the whole game because uh, Lazio, to be honest, uh, should have been in front um, and they were dominant for the first sixty sixty five minutes of the game. Um, there was a strong penalty shout um, early on, about twenty five minutes in. Um, Bruno Perez tripping Lucas Biglia, the Lazio captain. Um, at, fir- at first, it was going to be a penalty, and he'd awarded that. Then, after a lot of complaining and talking to the official behind the goal, who's never do anything, and then the linesman and back and forth and players moaning, it was then awarded correctly as a free kick outside the box. So they didn't didn't get any luck there, Lazio. But um, yeah, they they were really hammering Roma, and they were seriously struggling um, until. Uh, until Wallace decided to make uh, a very un-Brazilian um, sort of move. I'm not sure what he was trying to do on the edge of his box, but he was being closed down by Kevin Strootman, and um, for some reason he sort of went to dummy the ball. I'm not sure he meant to dummy the ball, um, or he just completely missed trying to kick it. But yeah, it just went horribly wrong straight through his legs, and Strootman said, oh, thank you very much, uh, took the ball into the box and, and tapped it in. Um, yeah, so it completely against the run of play. But, um, yeah, great for Roma, Um, and then they just took all the initiative then. Um, They were happy to then do their usual of sit back um, and hit on the counter, and they did that, and Nijngelen scored an absolute peach of a goal. Uh, Marchetti probably could have done better with it, um, but it was one of his typical shots from distance, and um, it snuck in in the the bottom corner. Um, There was the usual... A uh, bit of scrapping on the pitch as well between the players, obviously. Some nice tackles flying in. Uh, the, the, probably the best part was Strootman. I think it was after he'd scored the goal, as he was walking along the side of the pitch, grabbed a, uh, grabbed a bottle of water, and Cataldi for Lazio, one of the subs, um, came up to give him a piece of his mind about something. So Strootman uh, squirted the water in his face. Um, obviously, Cataldi then fell to the floor, claiming as if he died, man, had acid or something thrown in his face, but then got up and grabbed Strootman by the uh, back of the neck and pulled his shirt and everything else. So he got sent off without even being on the pitch. Um, so just your, just your normal Rome derby. Um, but yeah, d- Rome have had a bit of a hoodoo over Lazio since the, the Coppa Italia final where, when Lazio beat them. Um, but ever since then, yeah, Rome have won every single one. Oh, sorry, not lost the game. Um, but yeah, Lazio will be disappointed because they started much better and, and probably should have been in front were it not for um, some wasteful chances. 
Yeah, that I did see that that Stroopman stuff. That was embarrassing, wasn't it? Like <laughs> pulls his shirt, goes down like he'd been shot. It didn't go anywhere near his face. Um, I think we've we've seen a few incidents, haven't we? A certain Sas Fabregas was also guilty this weekend of over egging the pie to get a fellow professional sent off. So uh, is it clever or is it wrong? You decide, listeners. But it wasn't exactly great to watch. But nevertheless, good win for Roma. I know we have a question on Roma later on, so we'll get to that in the onion bag. But we'll move on to our next game, which uh, saw the champions. Uh, get back into some sort of order after last week's uh, Genoa fall apart. Um, they beat Atalanta, who themselves have had a good season this season. So three one. Did they uh, did they deserve it on the night? Yeah, absolutely. This is probably Juventus' best performance of the season. Um, Atalanta were the form team in uh, Syria. Um, I think they'd only lost one in their last eight. Um, and they, you know we've been talking about how well they've been doing how. Uh, energetic they are, so many young players, so many exciting young Italian players as well. Juve have been struggling, um, how many defensive injuries they've had. Uh, they shifted to the back four that we talked about last week, um, with most of the BBC being out injured. So um, you had Ragani in there, Lidstein, Achillini and Alexandro as the back four. Um, they sort of went to a 4-3-1-2 and Pjanic was actually the man in the hole with Dybala missing. Um, and yeah, they just totally outplayed Atalanta. Just absolutely brilliant. Uh, first goal from uh, Alexandro, 15 minutes in, uh, picked the ball up on the left wing, come inside onto his right foot and drilled it in. Uh, really, really good goal from him. And then two, both from set pieces, one for Ragani uh, about five minutes after and another for Mandzukic into the second half. Uh, both two really good headed goals. Um, Atalanta did get a goal back late on uh, from Fourier. Um, again, the slight weakness they've got at the back at the moment being exposed from crosses um, not too much of a surprise because Atalanta are dangerous it was a very good goal and really well taken but just that Juve performance was so much better and going into obviously the Champions League midweek um, it will really reassure them because their fans were getting a little bit worried with all the players they had out injured um, looks like Dybala should be back soon um, which is a big plus for them um, Marquisio still sort of nursing him in and out of the team obviously coming off that long-term injury. Uh, but things starting to look a little bit better there. And obviously they're under a lot of pressure as well. You know, uh, Roma getting that win puts them under pressure in the form Milan are in as well. Um, you know, they haven't, got this, they haven't got the league easy this year. No, no, very much back to dominance of, uh, of Juve. And uh, yeah, it'd be very interesting to see what, what Juve are like when they've got the injured players back as well, because um, they still seem to keep winning. It's a good habit to have. Nevertheless, Atalanta is still having a very, very good season, it's got to be said. So sure, they won't be too downhearted. Um, and uh, Sassuolo, um, good old Nero Verdi there. They're slowly but surely starting to um, refine some of that form of last season, aren't they? Because they had a pretty terrible start to the season, not a great Europa League campaign. Um, and it, is it a coincidence that now they're out of that competition, suddenly things are picking up? Uh, it's definitely helped, yeah. They, they faced uh, Empoli, successful at home, they won 3-0. Um, it was a really comfortable performance and it was a very good performance as well. They, Despite the fact, obviously, their squad has been stretched by Europe, they actually haven't played very well this season at all. Uh, this is a much better performance. Um, they had, again, because uh, they've got that European uh, competition, it did stretch their squad. They had injuries at the same time, which really didn't help. Um, but yeah, Pellegrini started that off uh, scoring from a penalty and then Ricci scoring from a penalty as well. Um, they've had uh, four different penalty takers this season and all of them have scored, uh, which is really nice. Um, Ragusa getting the third one for Sass, a little bit of a mistake in the box. Um, the Empoli defence there. Uh, just not following the ball into the back post and he had a nice easy tap in but really important win for them to try and get back on uh, winning ways um, still some problems uh, you know uh, you know, because Defrel uh, Matri still deciding on who's the best up front um, still contesting uh, the 3 nil automatic loss for the ineligible player that they've got fielded but definitely good result for them hopefully can turn around their season a little bit and because you know you, d- you don't expect Although for the size of the club, it's not the worst thing in the world to finish in the bottom half of the table. Um, just the way they've been perform- performing the last few years, you expect them to finish higher. And hopefully this will spur them on and get them up the table a bit more. Um, and maybe give them a chance for Europa League again next season. Yeah, here, here. Just, just for the song and for the kits and for Def Rel. Just for those reasons alone, then let's hope they kick on. So, uh, yeah, good result for them. What, um, what were the other results in uh, this weekend's action in Serie A then? 
Yeah, uh, we do have games ongoing, but I'll get to them in a moment. Uh, Friday night, oh dear, uh, we saw Napoli completely destroy Inter Milan, three uh, 0 uh, Zielinski, absolute brilliant performance from him, uh, man of performance for him for Napoli. Uh, but him, Hansik, and Insigne, another good, very good goal from Insigne as well in that match. Worth looking up if you're not an Inter fan. That is, uh, Milan kept the winning run going, two uh, one against Crotone, uh, late winner from Lapadula. Um, just can't stop scoring for him been brilliant signing for him um, also did his wonderful celebration first goal at the San Siro uh, got booked and kept doing his celebration with his ears out to the fans whilst the ref was booking him which I thought was very good uh, Pascara and Calgary uh, led out to a 1-0 uh, um, a decent point for both really still struggling a little bit uh, Samp continue their decent form and our upswing uh, getting a 2-0 win very surprising though because it was against Torino just couldn't find the back of the net on the day. Um, but really good result for Samp. Disappointed for Torino. And they've got a tough game next week as well uh, to look forward to against Juventus. Uh, Fiorentina continued their decent goal scoring form. Uh, 2-1 win over Palermo. Uh, Bernadeschi and Babacar uh, with a late winner there. Uh, Chievo Genoa is on... Should be finished actually by now. Let me just double check. Nil, nil, nil. It was. Finished nil, nil. And Udinese Bologna is just kicking off now as we speak. Yes, I'll uh, I'll keep you posted. There was a missed penalty in that game as well. I think Kiova missed a penalty, so um, and Genoa dominated the second half but couldn't score. So uh, yeah, nil nil, not good. Uh, so where does that leave us on table? Um, you can include the Genoa nil nil result if you like. Yeah, uh, Juventus are top on thirty six points, but Roma with that win in the derby cut the gap to four points, uh, tied with Milan. That's second and third. Um, so, yeah, you can just see how good Milan's form has been. Uh, Napoli getting back into form on 28 points. Probably too far away from Juve, realistically, to catch them. But um, still with a chance to Champions League spot. Lazio as well, uh, despite the loss, still in very good form. Have been recently 28 points. Same as Atalanta. Torino just behind them on 25. Uh, further down the table, you've got just absolutely terrible for the bottom four, really. Uh, Palermo, uh, Crotone, both on six points. Pescara just above them on eight. And Empoli on ten. I think that's the worst uh, uh, amount of points for the bottom four teams has ever had in Syria uh, history. So, uh, wow. yeah, not looking good for any of those sides. No, really not not looking good at all. And uh, you had a little bit of news from Yes, the week? we got a bit of news. Um, I, I don't think we mentioned it last week, but Palermo do have a new manager, which is, I suppose, is no. the news. Uh, Eugen- Surely not. <laughs> Eugenio Colini has uh, taken the place of uh, De Zerbi at Palermo. He had his first game um, and, uh, yeah, didn't, didn't do great, didn't win, but, yeah. It actually played quite well. That was in the Coppa Italia midweek, so it was a decent performance. Um, as for other news, um, there was a little bit uh, I wanted to mention. Oh, yes, uh, Bellotti has signed a new deal with Torino. Uh, it does have a buyout clause. It is only for clubs outside of Italy. It is €100 million. Euros. Um, if he keeps up this goal-scoring form, it... Oh. It's, it's, it seems obscene amount of money, but it wouldn't surprise me in football these days if someone actually tried to activate it in the summer, because um, he has been so good. And if he keeps it up throughout the season, I, yeah, I don't see why a club wouldn't go for it. Um, and Stefan Lulic is in a bit of trouble as well from the uh, derby. Um, apparent, allegedly made racist remarks against Anthony Rudico, which he's come out and apologised for, but will likely be facing a lengthy ban. Oh dear, naughty boy, naughty boy. And I should say, Palermo were really unlucky not to get a point from Fiorentina last night. I watched that game. And yeah, they, 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 really, they really have actually, they did improve in both games in the Coppa Italia and, and last night. So um, I don't know how long he's going to be there or how much of a chance he'll get. <laughs> but uh, he is a uh, Palermo boy, played there, was captain. Uh, the fans really wanted him um, and he seems to have energised the team a bit. They obviously need to get results. Um, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to get him out of the relegation zone. I read a stat. I think it's something like 53 managers. It might be more. Wow. Uh, Zamperini has had uh, since he's been in charge uh, at Palermo. That's over 20-something years. Uh, bear in mind, though, there's been 10 managerial changes in the last year alone. So uh, Yeah. That, that is just crackers, isn't it? The yeah. stability element is just nuts, but... Okay, well, uh, that's um, that's the week done in Serie A. Then, is there a game that you uh, particularly looked at for next week? Yes. Um, well, there's two really, but the, the big one is uh, sadly will be when we're recording. It's Monday night, Roma Milan, uh, eight o'clock Monday night. Um, 
both teams uh, just uh, a few points behind Juve, uh, uh, two, uh, sorry, four points behind. So Juventus will be obviously hoping for a draw there, um, but whoever wins that will be likely the team to go on to challenge Juve for the title. And Juve have got a tough game themselves. Um, Torino do need to bounce back from that loss, and Juve have got a travel to Turin. Uh, sorry, to Torino, so a Turin derby as well. Oh, when's that? Uh, that Saturday. is the Sunday, two o'clock. Oh, I might have to watch that one. That yeah. sounds a bit tasty to me. Should be a good one. Good. Okay. So uh, I know, as I say, well, I think we've got a couple of Serie A questions for you later on as well. So we'll we'll touch on those shortly. But we will leave Italy behind for another week, and uh, we'll finish up with a little bit of Spanish action. And it's this week's La Liga. Okay, uh, I'll be doing the intro for this week's La Liga. Um, I suppose we should start off with a game that probably everyone but me watched. Uh, <laughs> I was busy. I was busy watching Italian football, and I forgot that it was on Saturday. I thought it was on for Sunday for some reason. But of course, I'm talking about El Clasico because everyone else watched it, not me. <laughs> so, Chris, please tell me everything that happened in the one-all draw between Barcelona and Real Madrid because I didn't see any of it. Well, I can do my best, but I've got to confess, I didn't watch it like completely either myself. I was just as bad. I thought it was a tea time kickoff. I didn't realise it was a three o'clock kickoff. So I got in like 15 minutes later and I was watching it while I was watching PSG get taken apart uh, in Montpellier. So I only saw the main bits. But um, from what I could see or from what I watched, it was a fairly even contest. Um, although I think Barcelona ultimately will look at this as points dropped because obviously they were the home side and, and needed the points more. They did actually go in front though um it was um a very kind of would it be fair to say it was deserved i don't know that i wouldn't say they were battering Real madrid but they were probably just about the better side and luis suarez uh, nodded home a header from a neymar cross just after the break 53 minutes um and uh fair to say Keylor navas was livid after the goal he was uh, really not a happy bunny thrashed the ball upfield narrowly missing gerald Piquet's head which is quite amusing but um yeah it was uh probably a deserved score at that particular point but Real Madrid uh, they kept going they kept pushing uh, Cristiano wasn't exactly firing all cylinders obviously they got no no Gareth Bale so they changed formation slightly in that they went with Benzema up front with three attackers behind Imisco uh, Lucas and um, uh, Cristiano was, was playing up left uh, Lucas Vasquez that is and uh, they did get the equaliser in the last minute and wouldn't you just know it Sergio Ramos, he um, he seems to have a bit of a habit of scoring very, very important goals. And I, I'm pretty sure he's got quite a few in the Classicos down the down the years. And uh, he nodded the, uh, the equaliser literally as the 90 minute ticked by. So um, on as even, as I say, um, fr- from my point of view and from an outsider looking in, I would say it's much more a point gain for Real Madrid than it is a point gain for Barca um, because the, the gap at the top is six points. And uh, that essentially means Barca need to go to the uh, to the um, Bernabeu and get points off Real Madrid and hope Real Madrid drop points in the meantime, which right now it doesn't appear that they're going to do so. Yeah, good result for Madrid. They'll be uh, happy with that. Uh, now we'll move on to another Real, Real Betis against Celta Vigo. Uh, slightly more exciting game, a 3-3. Free free. Yeah, I watched this game on Sunday morning. Um, usually I have Sunday league in, in Sunday mornings, but it's the third week I haven't. So I've been watching a little bit of Spanish and Italian games on a Sunday morning. And this one was, it was a really weird game because it, it finished 3-3. And by logic, you'd say, wow, it's a cracker. Um, it wasn't really because it was just a, such a strange game. The home side were really terrible for, for a good period of time and Iago Aspas the former Liverpool player got uh, Celta deservedly in front on 15 minutes and at that point they were completely in control majority of the first half but then just before the uh, the break uh, Ruben Castro seems to score every time Betis play or every time they score he's, he's usually at the heart of it he got a penalty and uh, and the game was level just going into the break Sanabria then a second half Betis come out a completely different side um, Sanabria putting them in front from a, a Castro assist on 53 and then it was that bad Iago Aspas who uh, levelled once again for Celta Vigo in the 61st minute. And at that point, the game looked to be heading for a fairly comfortable draw. But then Pazella with a, a fl- 
absolute bullet header. I don't know what speed this went in at, but it was a, 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 a towering header from a corner which uh, bulleted the home side back in front. And uh, Ron Caglia uh, equalised for Celta Vigo. Again, only five minutes left on the clock. Um, and uh, up, up he rose, the Argentine, to, uh, to steer in the, the equaliser for Celta Vigo. It was a game played in absolutely torrential downpours um, for long periods of the, the game. There was just constant rain. It was tipping it down. Um, so that probably affected the play a little bit. But it was a cracker's game. But honestly, it was, I, it was just really, really strange because both sides played brilliantly for a period and then played awfully for another period. So very strange game. I um, should say as well, Petros was sent off for two yellows late on for Betis. No surprises there. And uh, yeah, honours even um, in, in a very sort of entertaining game in the end for probably all the wrong reasons. <laughs> That's just the kind we like. <laughs> yeah. Now, moving on to our last one, uh, another draw. We've got uh, a, str- a trio of draws uh, this week for La Liga. Uh, Deportivo Alaves against Las Palmas, uh, a one all there. Yeah, I picked this game mainly because I watched it. Um, Granada and Sevilla is probably a, a bigger game because Granada beat Sevilla, which I'll come to in a minute, which is quite a big result given the circumstances of the teams. But but I watched this one in the evening, so I wanted just to pick up on it. I quite enjoy Las Palmas. They're quite entertaining. They're quite fun to watch. They've got a player I really like the look of, actually, a guy called Tanner, um, who's a sort of a, a, a nippy, right-sided, tricky little player. Um, he's he's really good fun to watch, but it was it was a decent game. This and Las Palmas were in front. Uh, Alexis, not not that one. Um, he put them in front uh, from a, a cross after a corner had been sort of semi cleared, and he uh, nipped in at the post and put Alaves in front. Alaves, of course, you might remember were famous for getting to a UEFA Cup final with Liverpool all those years ago. Uh, I think one Jordi Cruyff was in their lineup that night, uh, and I believe it ended five four for memory after extra time. So there's a history uh, history for you. But um, yeah, Alaves promoted last season um, decent result this but they'll feel a little bit disappointed because they couldn't hold on to the lead um, and uh, it was an, an equaliser in the 57th minute quite amusing this I was watching it on Sky Sports and um, I think it was Jerry is it Jerry Armstrong does the co-commentary I think it was anyway who was, whoever was on co-commentary with, uh, with John Driscoll um, it was saying that uh, Marco Levaya who's of course a player you'll know a bit about John mm. uh, formerly of Inter and Atalanta and Empoli um, the uh, co-commentator was literally saying, he's like, oh, I wouldn't have Levi, I'd, I'd be taking him off. He looks overweight, he looks sluggish, and wouldn't you know it, the very next attack up pops Levi with a, a delicious near-post finish. Um, and then ran off to celebrate by pulling his shirt up to display his uh, his, uh, his his rather well-toned physique, which it was just amusing because you thought, well, there's no way he could have obviously heard the commentary from an English person in the studio in London. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was very, very beautifully timed. Um, he was later substituted and, and threw a massive hissy fit. So uh, yeah, may- maybe not all is well there, but good equaliser um, and a good point this for Las Palmas um, playing in their rather fetching for us and pink strip not really sure about that one to be honest but uh, yeah they're, they're quite fun to watch so uh, I thought I'd bring them up again uh, no Kevin Prince by thing though sad times no oh, that's never good we always like to see the Prince uh, would you want to give us the rest of the results from La Liga yes indeed so uh, we've got a game in progress at the moment uh, Deportivo La Coruña at the time of recording are currently 1-0 up on their Real Sociedad uh, goal from Sydney there so that one's in play at the moment um, we have uh, Sevilla I mentioned the Sevilla game um, they lost to Granada massive result this for Granada Sevilla's away form uh, coming into play once again for all the wrong reasons Granada was second bottom Sevilla were third at the start of play so it's a real shocker that for Sevilla, but three, uh, three, uh, sorry, two-one victory for Granada. Uh, Legolas Villarreal was a nil-nil draw. It was terrible. I tried to watch a lot of it. I have to admit, I turned off. It was really not good. Uh, the Atletico Madrid stumbling again, a nil-nil draw with uh, Tom's beloved Espanyol. Uh, Atletico really looking decidedly shoddy. More on their manager in a second. And uh, other results: Athletic Club Bilbao three-one victory over Abar on the Sunday. Sporting Gijón with a three-one victory over Osasuna on the same day. And Valencia 2, Malaga 2 was a Sunday evening game. Um, that was a belter, actually. Uh, I was kind of watching that in between Fiorentina and Nice. Um, that was a very, very decent game. Rodrigo and uh, Medran for Valencia. Uh, Pablo Fornals uh, with a double for Malaga, including a very last kick of the ball as an equaliser. You've got to love that, haven't you, when it's the very last kick of the ball that goes in the net. So uh, probably a, a, a valid point for Malaga, but Valencia will be gutted uh, to chuck away points at home once again. Lovely stuff. I uh, just want to run through the table quickly then. 
Yes, so Real Madrid are top of the league. Uh, six points clear of Barcelona. Actually, 34 points. Barcelona second on 28. Sevilla missing the chance to leapfrog Barcelona with that defeat to Granada there. 27 points. Atletico Madrid way back. 25 points. So uh, nine points off the top. Villarreal and Sociedad are fifth and sixth. Although Sociedad, of course, if they can turn around that game with Deportivo, could go up as high as fourth tonight if they get the victory. Uh, Bilbao, Ibar, Celta Vigo and Las Palmas make up the top ten. Down the table, got Malaga and Espanyol, 11th and 12th. Alaves, Betis and Leganes uh, reading down with the bottom four, sorry, bottom five. Currently Valencia and Gijón just outside the relegation zone, which currently has Deportivo, Granada and Osasuna. Although, again, Deportivo leading at the moment. In fact, they've just gone 2-0 up. That's timing for you. Look at that. Second goal for Deportivo La Coruña. So they're on course to win tonight. And if they do, they will go up to 13 points, which will take them above Sporting Gijón and Valencia into 16th. Yeah, very good. Um, completely unrelated. Um, if you get a chance, listeners, and you haven't seen it, go check it out. Just type in Lee Trundle penalty on Twitter. It's absolutely oh, ridiculous. Yes, yeah. Very <laughs> Spanish esque as well. Yeah, yeah. Or very Italian. It's, it's almost Panenka esque, isn't yeah. it? But it's, That's it's genius. Absolutely genius. Fantastic. It is. Sorry, so I just had to chuck that in there. It just came up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's all good. I was going to bring it up, actually, so I'm glad you've mentioned it. It's, it's, it is very, very good. Uh, good old Lee Trundle. Um, uh, I'll hand it back all over to you, then, Chris. Yeah, no worries. I've got two bits of news, actually, oh, so yes. I'll, just, I'll finish with that. Um, Martin Odegaard, remember him? Uh, the the teenage sensation out of Denmark, uh, signed by Real Madrid, questionable attitude, etc., etc. Looks like he's going to end up at St Etienne. Um, apparently, he was at the Ren at St Etienne game at the weekend, and it looks likely that he is going to be ending up signing for them in the January transfer window, probably on loan, you would imagine. Uh, but the uh, the um, the actual Renner or the other club who are also interested in his signature, oddly enough. So it seemed like a good uh, a good game for his agent to attend. Um, and the Ren sporting director, who you might remember, Mikel Silvestre, uh, apparently is trying to negotiate Sadly. the deal. <laughs> Indeed, uh, see down as well. But it looks like either way, Odegaard will be playing his trade in France in January. So we shall see. And the only other bit of quick news was Diego Simeone, uh, candid interview he gave uh, in La Liga this week, uh, where he said the following: uh, "It is true, I will manage Inter in the future. This is not news." So uh, there you go. He's obviously uh, sizing up his next job <laughs> in, uh, at Inter if he so chooses to get the chance. So there we go. Very right. Good. Okay then, so that's the uh, that's the week up of a uh, week up or roundup of our weekend's action in Europe, I should say. We're going to take a little diversion now and see what else is going on in uh, in, in the other places around the world. And this week, we're off to Chile for the best of the rest. OK, I wanted to go to Chile because they are just one game away from the end of their Apertura season. Uh, Chile is another one of these leagues which is massively confusing in that nobody really understands. Well, I, I, people do understand, of course, that's, that's really insulting. But it's one of those leagues that sort of splits into two and then goes into playoffs and all that stuff. But anyway, all you need to know is that the Apertura is one game away from finishing. And uh, we do or we're very, very close to having champions. And those champions will be Universidad de Católica. Uh, who just need a point from Wednesday, from their midweek game. I believe it's Wednesday. It might actually be Thursday. Early hours of Wednesday, anyway. Um, they go away to a Deport- Deportes Camuco. Um, and if they get a point from that game, they will be the Apertura champions. Uh, this weekend... It was, uh, it was quite quite the games, uh, quite the goals, actually, in this weekend's fixtures. Uh, Tamuka themselves lost to Universidad de Chile, who, of course, people will remember very, very well, uh, by three goals to nil. Uh, there was a 6-2 victory for Catolica, who, of course, as we said, potential champions. They were playing Deportes 
Iquique, who were actually second. So second meets tops. It's pretty much a playoff to see who wins. One player had a lovely old job, a lovely old weekend. Uh, he goes by the name of Nicolas Castillo, uh, formerly of Club Bruges, uh, believe it or not, and also briefly of Mainz, although it's a long time ago, and Frosinone. Uh, he scored four times, so we had a lovely afternoon. So 6-2 victory for Iquique, and uh, that means Catholic, as we say, are very close to winning the championship. Union Española could could uh, jump into second place if results go their way because they are currently sitting in third place. They beat Famagusta this weekend. Uh, O'Higgins, uh, not the snooker player, they lost 3-1 to Universidad Concession. And Colo Colo won 4-2 over Everton, which is quite impressive because, I mean, Everton were only playing Man United that afternoon. So to travel all that way and lose 4-2, uh, it's, it's difficult for them. Of course, it's Everton Davinia, of course. Um, but uh, just looking at the table, a couple of big name sides that are down the bottom end. Um, again, if you follow your South American football, uh, Cobresal are bottom. Seems surprising. Audax Italiano are quite a big side. They're down the bottom four. Uh, Everton Davinia themselves are, are 13th. And uh, Wachipato are 10th, who've usually been pretty good in the uh, Copa Libertadores. So some, uh, some entertaining stuff in Chile, as you probably expect. Uh, full of goals, full of red cards, full of fights. Um, it all goes off in Chile. It's all great fun. So by next weekend, we could have new Chilean Apertura champions. Okie dokie. So that's the uh, that's the best of the rest for this week. Again, as usual, as we say, if there is a league you want us to uh, to focus on, if you want to get an update from a specific league around the world, drop us a tweet. We'll do our best. Um, just a heads up, though, if you ask us to look at the, I don't know, the Estonian Premier League, um, it might be a bit of a difficult one. So try and keep it sensible. <laughs> Thanks very much. Right, let's move on then. And it's time to introduce you all to another one for our catalogue. And it's this week's Hipster's Choice. Right, this week our Hipster's Choice... uh, Oh, I'm going to enjoy this one because we're coming back to France this week for a little Hipster's Choice. And uh, it's quite a rare one this week because we've decided that we the goalkeepers have not had enough love recently. So this week's Hipster's Choice is Toulouse's Alban Lafont. So what do we do? What do we know about Alban Lafont? Well, as you say, he is a goalkeeper. He's only 17 years of age, plays for Toulouse, wears the number 40 shirt, and he's a France under 18 international. He's actually born in Burkina Faso, uh, six foot four inches tall, 176 pounds. That's 80 kilograms in, uh, in old money. He's right footed. He is on Twitter, although not verified, bless him. He's at Alban Lafont. Uh, so Lafont was born in, uh, Uga- oh, goodness me, Ouagangu. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, it's the capital of Burkina Faso. Look it up yourselves if you want to pronounce that one. Uh, he was born to a French father and a become oh, a Burkinabi mother. His parents separated when he was nine years old, with Lafont moving to France to live with his father in Haro, while his mother remained in Burkina Faso. Lafont actually started his amateur career with a- a- AS Latois. Uh, where he initially began playing his playing his trade as an attacking midfielder before converting to a goalkeeper. He spent six years with Latois, uh, could be Latois, but I'm going to go with Latois, uh, before signing for the Ligue 1 side Toulouse in 2014. And he spent more than a year at the Toulouse Academy before the manager at the time, Dominic Arabage, handed him his Ligue 1 debut at, uh, on the 28th of November 2015 against OGC nice, nice. At the beginning of the season, the youngster was fifth choice goalkeeper, incredibly. Upon doing so, he became the youngest ever goalkeeper to play in Liga at the age of just 16 years, 310 days, surpassing the previous record held by Miguel Landrell. Having been 10 points adrift of safety at the time, Toulouse's introduction, sorry, Lafont's introduction to the Toulouse first team uh, managed to help them avoid relegation on the final day of the season, thanks in part to their eight clean sheets kept by Lafont in his 24 appearances of that campaign. On the 30th of June 2016, he signed a new contract extending his stay to 2020. And in 2016-17 thus far, he's been Toulouse's number one keeper. He's kept clean, six clean sheets in 16 league appearances, not bad, and uh, is tied for fifth in terms of goal keep, goals conceded with Monaco uh, 16 also conceded. Lafont has named man of the match in Toulouse's 0-0 draw with Angers on October 22nd 2016 
and along with Milan's uh, Gigi Donnarumma, Lafont is one of the most exciting under-20 goalkeeping prospects in European football. Lafont is naturally athletic and blessed with freakish reflexes, and he's also very composed and good in the air. He's maybe not as technically refined as the aforementioned Donnarumma, but sometimes struggles to con- contain shots, given the way too many rebounds. However, his, he has all the attributes to develop into a world-class goalkeeper. He has played with France under-16, under-17 levels, and as we said, currently plays for the under-18s. And he has been linked recently with the likes of Arsenal, Porto, Juventus, and rather surprisingly, Watford. Pick out the odd one out there. Okay, so uh, my thanks to uh, to Kelly, as usual, for compiling those uh, notes for me. And I want to ask my panellists uh, their thoughts on uh, goalkeepers and, and all things goalkeeping. So, uh, John, we'll start with you because Gigi Domenaruma's name was mentioned twice in that piece there from Kelly. And um, he obviously is the, the big name when it comes to young goalkeepers in and around yeah. Europe. What do you um, what do you think of, of so many young goalkeepers breaking through? Because we always think of goalkeepers as maturing when they get to their thirties or beyond. Donnarumma and, and the likes of Lafont are changing that. Why, what do you put that down to? And and how far do you think a, a player like a Donnarumma or a Lafont can go in the in the world game? Um, I think generally speaking, Donnarumma, Lafont, they're exceptions to the rule. Um, you are. There is a trend that goalkeepers, uh, you're seeing younger goalkeepers come in uh, starting as first team players rather than sort of coming in for the cup competitions, that kind of thing. Like you see in the Premier League, you'll see some rotation there for FA Cup or League Cup, that kind of thing. Um, So there is a little bit of a trend that way, but I do think for the most part they are exceptions because you do have to have a completely different mentality and be so confident in your decision makings. And you can't doubt yourself at all as a goalkeeper. there's a there's this sort of the old cliche of you know goalkeepers are the weirdos of the team they're a bit crazy um, cause you have to have this kind of level of arrogance about yourself that's separate from say that you would get with a striker where you have to be uh, sort of confident and cocky and yeah I can beat three players it's fine and I'll score a goal you have to have a slightly more psychotic <laughs> approach to it I think being a goalkeeper um, the one thing with with uh, I think we've done a rumor in Lafont is that they they've still got flaws both of them. Um, and they're quite easy to spot, but they are a fi- it is a thing of they will just come uh, naturally with age and playing more games and getting used to it. Um, but, you know, I, I think actually Germany probably has uh, maybe not the same like low, low age level of uh, 17, 16 that you've seen with Lafon and uh, Donnarumma and a few others, but they generally tend to have a lot younger players throughout the team and in goalkeeper positions as well so it might be a trend that started there first and it sort of spread out wider for Europe yeah so two two very very big names and Drew with regards to the Bundesliga and and Germany of course Manuel Neuer is <clears throat> excuse me has always been the the big name in German goalkeeping but there's, there's two not as young but still two young goalkeepers in the Bundesliga that you want to highlight with regards to the future of, of maybe the German national team and in a similar vein to Lafont and Donnarumma I mean, it'll be similar, but uh, it's always difficult because you never know if they are going to have a future because Neuer could go on and play until he's 40 and then there goes their future because Neuer is very much a generational goalkeeper in the sense that you had the likes of Oliver Kahn before him. But, uh, you know, Bert Leno is one of the ones that we were talking about. And then uh, who's other we mentioned? Is there one? I can't. It's one of those days. I'm, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, Timo Horn is the other one. So those two, I mean, they're 23 and 24 now, so they're they're still about four or five years away from being in their prime as a goalkeeper. And you know, they're they're not as young as Donna River, um, you know, and Lafont, but they've been getting a lot of first team minutes. You know, they're in a, a country and in the league that love to let young players play if they're good enough. And Germany, more so than maybe anybody else, they're fantastic at producing goalkeepers, and they always have been. Um, you know, Mark Andre Ter Stegen went, went off to Barcelona, and he was highly tatted when he was at Gladbach. Um, Ralph Fireman had showed a lot of promise, you know, for Schalke before when he was a little bit younger. So it's it's it's, it's a trend, and you know, it's, I can only I, there's not too much to highlight about them. Just the fact that goalkeepers are one of those positions, as John said, where you know you have to be a little bit nuts, but you you have to show maturity, and even though. The younger the keeper, the more mistakes they're going to make. And I think we've all of us have seen that time and time again. But I think people expect it. And 
they are more understanding when a keeper who's young makes mistakes than when it's a striker who can't finish when he's young. They say, oh, well, he's just, you know, he's just crap at finishing. He's never going to have a future. But, you know, keepers have a way of constantly progressing as long as they play at, at a higher level. And even if they don't go on to have a glistening career, they still might make a decent career. Where, whereas a young striker could be the next best thing and then fall off the face of the planet, like Freddie Mico Macheda. We were talking about that earlier as a prime example. <laughs> So it's interesting to see how, how, how keepers sort of operate and, and what you can expect of them as they move forward. It's just it's just good to see. Yeah, indeed. And uh, when you look at what uh, Loris Carius is currently going through mm-hmm. in Liverpool, it uh, yep. can go one way or the other very much so. And but he we was will... very highly touted in Germany. And we spoke about it, and you, you didn't know of making a move to the Premier League where fan expectations work differently than they do in Germany. You know, in Germany, they're a bit more understanding when a player is younger. And, and the Premier League, as we all know, a young player comes in and it's supposed to be the next best thing and they expect them to win the World Cup single-handedly even though it's club football. <laughs> one mistake <laughs> one mistake in, the, in your ostracized from the community for months. So well, it depends, see, but, you know, he's a quality keeper. And if it doesn't work out for him there, he might go back to Germany and you might see the best of him again as you saw when he was at Mainz, you know, the season before. So we'll see. Yeah, very true. Of course, moving from Mainz is less pressure than playing for a club like Liverpool as well. So, yes, yes uh, one to keep an eye on. But we will, of course, keep an eye on Alban Lafont's career at Toulouse. Um, he is very, very highly touted. And for all of you asking um, if we were going to uh, do Hips' choice for Gigi Donnarumma, um, it doesn't seem like there's much point because he's already a hugely touted uh, footballer. So uh, I don't think we're going to do that. But you never know. Uh, you never know. But, um, yeah, two, two very, very highly rated keepers to keep an eye on. Uh, there is a goalkeeper in Spain that we will be looking at in the coming weeks. So we'll, uh, we'll let that one just tease the air. Right. OK, let's um, finish then, as we always do, with uh, some of your questions answered. And it's this week's onion bag. Right then, gentlemen, uh, this week uh, we've got a fairly good split of questions, actually. Um, and that means we've got some League R questions. I know I was surprised as well. Um, we'll start with one, actually. Uh, this one comes from at Abbas underscore Galib. I think that's how you pronounce it. Hopefully, uh, if I'm wrong, Abbas, I do apologize. Uh, he wants to ask me, is Thomas Lamar the next big French talent and Leonardo Jardim, a manager to look out for. Um, it's a good question, Abbas. Thomas Lamar is he's definitely one of the next big French players to look out for, or talents in Liga. I, there's so many. I know I'm a little bit biased, just a little bit, but there is so much young talent in Liga. It's hard to pin it on just one. Uh, there's a question about another young talent coming up, actually, in a minute that we'll, we'll get to. But he is definitely one to keep an eye on. Um, supremely talented um, very, very good dribbler, likes to use both feet. He's got a hell of a shot on him, as John mentioned earlier on. Just have a look at his goal from the weekend. Um, kind of rose to prominence this season with his performances against Tottenham in the Champions League. He's one that, that could potentially go all the way. And he's he's one of the main players that I think if Monaco were to sell on some of their bigger assets, like Fabinho, for example, I think he could step into the mark and, and fill up that space. So, yeah, he's, he's definitely one of the big talents in France right now. Uh, as for Leonardo Jardim... He's always been a very good manager. I think the only questions levelled at him, particularly last season, were could he entertain as well as uh, win matches last year. Monaco were not very entertaining at all. Uh, This year, they are anything but not entertaining. They're magnificent to watch this year. So, yeah, I think Jardim could manage at a higher level. I'm not sure who. It's very difficult to say. I think I think he's happy at Monaco right now. Um, he's certainly happy with his wages. And, uh, yeah, I think he'll probably stick around for a little while yet. If he was to manage in another country, I think he'd probably suit Spain. Um, but I couldn't tell you which club. So, um, yeah, he's, he's a manager to keep an eye on. But I think he's quite happy at Monaco for now. OK, let's find another question. Uh, this one's for you, Drew. This kind of came. It's kind of a question slash statement, but I'd be keen just to get a, a brief bit of input from you anyway. Comes from mm-hmm. our friend uh, Gunnar, Out, Gunnar Outpost. And he says, um, he said, lads, I'm doing a, a Leipzig career mode on FIFA and I wanted to make it as realistic as possible. Can you give me some rules, e.g. tactical approach, transfer style stra- slash limitations, when and how they sell players, formations to use, etc.? So, Obviously, you're the man. So if you were starting a Leipzig career, uh, what sort of things would you be looking at uh, at Gunnar Outpost doing with his side? And what that's kind of an, rules? That's an awfully big commitment. <laughs> for, Isn't for it, Justin? Um, 
Uh, no, for okay. So for me, I mean, the biggest thing that you want is if you look back um, over the course of uh, the summer, especially. I mean, they they brought in younger players. What what they're looking for is they want stability moving forward in the first team, and they want to build with the players that they brought in. So, for example, they brought in Marius Muller uh, from uh, Kaiser Slaudern. Um He's only 23, and with the keepers that they have, you know, Cole Torti is already 36, so theoretically when he's done, they'll have Peter Gulaxi and then Marius Muller moving forward. They loaned in Kyriakos Papadopoulos from Leverkusen. They brought in Bernardo and Benno Schmitz. Both of them came from uh, Red Bull Salzburg. So one of the things that they do is they do still tap into their Red Bull partnership. So if you can ever find younger players from Salzburg that you can bring in, most likely on the cheaper end of things, then that's one thing you can target depending on the position you're looking for. Um, they do promote from their youth system um, when, when they can. They're trying to do uh, better things with that. You know, they brought in Nebi Keita as well, also from, from Salzburg. He's only 21. Um, Oliver Burke's only 19. Timo Werner's only 20. So they really focused on younger players bringing them in so they want to build that core that they hopefully can keep together as they move forward. Um, they don't make a lot of big purchases, um, honestly. I think... I think I don't remember if Nabi Keita or uh, Timo Werner was uh, more expensive, but they don't really spend a lot of money. Uh, let me look it up. Okay, I'm sorry. So Nabi Keita was 15 million euro. Oliver Breck was 15 million euro. Timo Werner was 10 million euro. So they don't spend 20, 30 million euro or pounds on players they look to spend total you know 40 50 60 million on five six seven eight players so they can really get good depth with with youth um for the first team and also for the system um as regards to tactics they play you know four two 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 um two strikers so usually yusuf polson and timo Werner. polson is quick and but Chris Cantesi is very very good in the air. He can hold the play up well. Timo Werner plays off that shoulder. Then they have uh, Emil Forsberg, um, usually on one flank, and then uh, Marcel Sabitzer on the other. Or they'll bring in Oliver Burke. Um, so one winger is creative. One winger is more quick, direct, good on the ball. Um, so you get a bit better of a tactical balance in the middle. It's Navigate and Diego Demi. Both of them are their workhorses. They can go box to box routinely through 90 minutes. Uh, Nabiketa does get further forward with Diego Demi when he does get up. He still sort of sits back and still provides that shield, but both of them are fantastic engines. Um, the wing backs do contribute sometimes, but so, I mean, I don't want what more I should say on it other than don't spend a ton of money. Look for good quality youth players you can bring in. Um, and, that, and then there you go, and then just play more of a counter-attacking, high-acting kind of style. Don't look to possess too much, but just sort of hit them with pace on the flanks. Have a few creative players who can play a good long ball, or can, who you can take on your man as well, and, and you, you should be set. I'm pretty sure that uh, Gunnar Outpost will be happy with that uh, that answer. So, <laughs> yeah, good stuff. And um, we'll, we'll, let us know how you get on, uh, Mr. Outpost. Let us know. You how don't you win the league, going. you fail. Yeah, true. <laughs> it's interesting, actually, very briefly, that the amount of money, you know, everyone slates their projects and everything. Well, they haven't spent a huge amount of money, so it's, it's quite no, interesting. It's, uh, it's 50 million they spent. Like I said, 15 for Nabi Keita, and he's been absolutely brilliant. Oliver Burke for 15 million. Timo Werner, 10 million. He already has eight goals, so already an instant return. Mm-hmm. Bernardo was 6 million. Marius Muller with 1.7. Um, Papadopoulos was a loan. The loan fee was 1.5 million, and then Benno Schmitz was, uh, I think, 100,000 euro. Um, and they didn't really sell anybody for money, but you know they, they do have financial backing. But 50 million on seven players is completely acceptable if you go on and get Champions League in your first season after promotion, and then you're looking to build the club. They're looking to maybe move to new ground. They the goal is to become a regular in Champions League in the next three to five years. And if they had to spend 50 million in their first season to do it, and they get that goal ahead of schedule, then it's completely worth it. They'll make that money back in the season. So. Agreed. Yeah, and they will always divide opinions, but uh, yes. we've um, we've got a piece actually. Our, our good friend Korosh Korosh Masavi has has written his piece, um, which he's ready to. Uh, in fact, I think he might actually have sent it to me. I must have a look. Um, but yeah, he is uh, he's ready to put his piece up on our website about RB Leipzig and his thoughts. So um, do look out for that when we've uh, when we get that one up. We will let you know how cool. that goes. Korosh and I had a really long talk about uh, Hassan Hudel, considering he's connected with. Like going to Arsenal when Wenger's done. Um, yep. Karsh is someone who would be fun to, to sit down 
with all of us and talk more about. He's got an excellent knowledge of, of the Bundesliga, obviously, and um, he highlighted a lot of things that I think that a lot of people who wouldn't know should pay attention to, considering um, their project and uh, how people view Hassan Hudel and and and, and Rennick as well. And he, he's more important than people outside of Germany give him credit for. So it, it'll be interesting. Everyone should definitely check that out as a read because, uh, of course, a, a brilliant guy. Superb. There you go. There, and there you are, Chorus. There is the invitation. If you ever want to come on the pod, then you just let us know. We'll we'll make it happen. Uh, right. Next question is for John. This comes from Jay, who's at All in the Past. He wants to say Roma uh, looks super convincing this morning. I guess he was watching the Rome derby at the time uh, against Lazio. He said they only trail Juve by four points. Can they finally win the league? In your opinion? Um. If uh, the the eternal question with Roma is. They turn up in these big, important games and they get results and you think everything's fine and then they drop points against the teams where they're expected to win and it's easy and they haven't really done that. Um, this season, they started off a little slow, but they've turned it round. Everyone seems to be firing. Uh, Dzeko is having the season of his life. He's just playing absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think Spalletti said that if he could design the perfect striker, it would be Edin Dzeko. Um, some of the goals he scored this season have been spectacular, uh, much to winding me up because I slated him so much at the start of the season. <laughs> but, yeah, J- James Horncastle, actually, the the who works for BT Sport, he, he made a really good point about how even De Rossi had said, we slip up in the small games, and if we don't do that, then we, we could go on and win the league. So, obviously, this weekend is huge because uh, they've got Milan who are in great form. If they can beat Milan then I think the week after they've actually got Juventus. Um, and obviously with Juve having a Turin derby and Torino, although they lost, they are, are still in great form and is is not going to be an easy game at all. Um, they've got a real chance. And, you know, Juve, as good as they were at the weekend, and it was their best performance, it is a change back line. They, they are playing a back four now, which is something they haven't really done this season. Um, I think it's something that they want, Allegri wants to move the team to permanently. But there will be weaknesses to exploit there because it is new. So um, if Roma can keep this good run going, then I don't see why not. Um, everyone's fit. Everyone's playing well. Uh, there's no arguments like there were before with Totti and the board and Spalletti. Um, they seem to have adapted really well to this back three system. Um, you know, Salah's playing great. The midfield's working. Defence is looking much better. Uh, Chesney has been playing much better and hasn't been into uh, up to any of his antics. So it all looks good for them. But yeah, the the key game, they, I really don't think they can afford to lose to Milan uh, this coming weekend, though. They need to win that game. Yeah, Edin Dzeko, he's, he's a player, I must admit, I, I always thought would be um, would be very, very decent at Arsenal. Um, again, for those who don't know, I'm an Arsenal fan. Uh, I'm sure you know that by now. But yeah, I, I always thought he'd do quite a good job at Arsenal. But um, obviously we missed the boat and uh, he is often the figure of fun. But as you say, um, that game with Milan is probably going to be a very interesting test of, of him and his Roma colleagues. So we will, uh, of course, be uh, across that game when it occurs. We've got um, two more questions here, three more questions here. Two are for me, so I'll quickly answer these two. Uh, and uh, the last one's for John, and then I've got a quick one for Drew. So that's a nice way to finish. Um, my good friend at PG Nez, uh, he wants to say, how stupid was that Mets fan? Could cost Mets... But also, if Leon are awarded the three points, they may have lost. Is that fair? It's a great question, um, PG. It's a great question. I mean, obviously, we covered it earlier on in the news. It is utter madness um, from, from the Mets fan who did it. I, I think there's a collection of, of fans together. Uh, I think it's obviously one who's, who's done the, uh, the stupid deed, as it were. But, yeah, it is absolutely crackers because Mets are, you know, they're a side that, that are... They're holding their own in league other season, um, but I would say they're holding their own to this point. And they are the sort of club that if they get a couple of bad results and they start slipping down the table, all of a sudden they're looking over their shoulders. Now, they've got 18 points at the moment and that, that puts them in 13th place. When you consider Bastia in the relegation playoff spot, I've got 14 points. So in other words, four points difference. If they get the points taken off of them in this result uh, or get no points from it or worse still get deducted points, suddenly they're back down in that relegation spot. And, and bearing in mind as well, they were winning the game now there's no guarantee they would have, have beaten Leon of course um but you know they were one nil up they were playing really well and it's just such a nonsensical thing to do um I I personally think Leon will get 
awarded the points. Um, if not, the game will be replayed maybe behind closed doors, but that seems like an awful amount of effort to work that out, seeing as we've got the winter break coming up soon. Scheduling is going to be a nightmare. Um, I have a funny feeling the, the French FA are just going to award the points to Leon and, and uh, say to Mets, get on with it, it's your own fault. And if that happens, um, you know, Leon will obviously take it, but it will always feel like a bit of a hollow three points, I guess. So it's, it's a really, really stupid situation to be in, in my opinion. Just, just quickly on that, was, the question was whether it's fair or not. I'm not sure whether it's fair or not, but the responsibility lies with Mets and yep. their stadium staff and security from stopping anyone from bringing those sort of things in. Now, I know it's really difficult, and you, uh, especially across Central Europe, obviously you see it in Italy with flares and smoke bombs and all that kind of thing, um, but it is the home club's responsibility um, to Absolutely. deal with those kind of things. So uh, I thought it's, it's just the rules, basically, isn't it? You know, every club yeah. knows it. So. It's, it's a weird one as well because, I mean, you know, flares and, and, and uh, smoke bombs and stuff. I mean, you know, you look at some of these these grounds around Europe, it, it, it leads to an amazing atmosphere. John, you've seen it in, in Italy. It's quite prevalent in Germany for certain stadiums, obviously safe standing in Germany as well. And then you'll see like little places uh, around Europe, like sort of Hungary and uh, obviously Poland has, has got a bit of a history with, with violence um, clashes at supporters of certain levels. But sometimes it adds to the atmosphere and it's amazing to see some of the, the um TFOs and and the flares and stuff but if people can't be responsible when they're doing it you you just you can't legalize them because they will always be an idiot um and in this case as you say john it's it's the club's responsibility to to manage that and make sure that these things don't come into the ground if that's the rule they want to impose um and if they want to allow them in the grounds then they need to at least police them when they're in there so it's crackers it is totally crackers but we'll we'll follow that story with interest and when we get announced well i'm sure we'll retweet that from our account so keep an eye on that one um right i'll ask you john your question then i'll go back for one of mine then we'll finish with the one for drew um actually no we'll do it the other way around just because uh drew's been quiet for a minute so drew my question <laughs> comes from me um we okay. touched on Wolfsburg earlier on with regards yeah. to their plight and stuff it's a very simple question how many of their stars quote unquote do you think could go in january i look specifically at ricardo rodriguez and julian drexler well <clears throat> I think that would depend on the need of other clubs. Uh, I know a bunch of clubs have been linked with Rodriguez in the past, Arsenal, um, Juventus, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe a couple others, uh, even Bayern at a certain time. Uh, but I, January might be tough. I think with Draxer coming out and, and, and saying un- unequivocally that he wants to go, I think you, I think we will see Draxer leave in January, but I think we'll see Rodriguez go um, in the summer. Uh don't be surprised if he ends up in the Premier League. Don't be shocked if he goes to City because Pep Guardiola was a big fan of his when Guardiola was at Bayern. Um, you could also maybe see him popping up at someone like a United, unfortunately, because they just love to spend money. Um, but I think both of the both of them will go for sure. I, I, I don't see any way around it, and the club are struggling financially as well, and they're both in demand. Rodriguez is only twenty four, and. Um, Jackson, I do believe somehow magically is still only 23, even though he's been around for quite some time. Um, yeah, he he was playing with Raul before Raul retired, <laughs> so <laughs> just just to throw that in there. But yeah, I think both of them will leave the club for sure. I think the club can get a pretty penny for both, but I don't think money is going to solve their issues. I think there's there's so many other issues, and we talked about it before without going into too much detail. There's so many issues at the club already that you know they might not be the only two to leave. But uh, you even see someone like a Dan Davi leave, who only has made six appearances thus far, despite you know, he was one of the only bright spots for last, last season, despite getting relegated. So, um, yeah, those two for sure, and maybe a couple others as well. But uh, it's not looking good for them moving forward, I don't think. No, no, it's really not. I was uh, interested by that. So thank you for your yeah. answer there. Uh, last one for John comes from our good friend Jimmy uh, who's um, meeting one of our other good friends this weekend actually, uh, Mr Shredder he, uh, he tongue in cheek what place do you expect Inter to finish next season in Serie B? <laughs> <coughs> Very good um, well I would expect them to at least get promoted but of course we still wouldn't win the league so second <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, on, a, on a serious note that, I mean I know, I know. We joke about it, and we watch, you know, we watch stuff and uh, interrupt every week. 
don't, don't they just strike you as almost a bit like the Sunderland of Serie A in that they just need to clear out all the players and just start again? Because it's just like every time they seem to bring in a new player, they disappear. They got Renocchi as playing again. Yeah, I mean, it's... The, the defence needs a serious overhaul. Um, like Miranda, I don't have a problem with. I think the rest of the defence, to be honest, you could probably do away with. Mario is still young enough that you can improve. Um, Pioli still obviously hasn't been there very long um, so you've got to give him time as well to implement all his plans and ideas whether he gets that or not we still don't know because uh, I still have no idea who's actually in charge of the club um, you know with the takeover and everything else they're, the Sunny group have put people in but whether they're actually in charge and is Fourier really still there or not it, it, that's still up in the air and well, actually probably the weirdest one is uh, Gabby Gull um, I don't know if anyone remembers that we spent all that money on him signed him you know um, the wonder star Brazilian uh, and I think he's played 16 minutes of football uh, since, he he's, wants, since he's joined so he wants to go doesn't he already apparently there's talk of him wanting to leave already yeah there's talk of him maybe being loaned out in January um, and then seeing what to do afterwards in the summer um, I, I really don't know Pioli obviously hasn't had a long time uh, with him or the, or the rest of the players so I hope to see him play at some point but uh, yeah that, that move hasn't worked out either so um, if it, it's just the club being pulled in too many different directions at once so yeah, it needs, needs a stable hand, and uh, hopefully Pioli stays for a few years and steadies the ship and they clear some players out and he gets the whole summer to restructure the team a bit, especially in defence. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. It's a bit of a mess. OK, and our final question, uh, it's another French question from our good friend Jansim Shaheen. Uh not enjoying his Nantes season of following, I'm sure. Uh, Morgan Sanson or Vincent Cosiello? Uh, Cosiello for me. Um, I, I really like Morgan Sanson, I have to say. I'm a big fan of his. I like his uh, low centre gravity. The way he plays the game is is good. Um, and with him, it's always been about fitness. If he can stay fit, he could be... Uh, he reminds me a lot of a young Valbuena, um, similar sort of player. I think he, he could be a very, very good little player. But for me, Cosiello is the big one. Um, I know we were saying earlier on, John, about the link with AC Milan. Yeah. Um, which uh, you know I kind of called a few weeks ago, just because I he he strikes me a little bit like Verratti, but in the opposite way. Um, I think he could work his game could work in Italy really well. I could see him sort of doing the Pirlo, if you will, for Milan, just sitting maybe with Locatelli in that midfield and just pulling the strings. Um, and also because he's quite small in stature, I'd I'd like to see him go to Italy, where hopefully he you know he could play his game. But it would be more about the tactical approach of play rather than the the hustle and bustle of, of sort of a Premier League or a La Liga se- yeah. season. So, I think he'll I think he'll do well. And of course, Milan are now the young side, aren't they, of Italy? So, yep. you know, he, he'd be in good company there. So, I hope it works out for him. But yeah, for me, Cosiello is uh, is the man I'd go for. So, good question, that. Okay, uh, we will wind things down for this week then. Another podcast in the bank. I just want to say thanks, of course, to all of our listeners. Uh, greatly appreciate you all. A couple of comments come in this week. Um, I just want to just want to highlight. Um, they had a comment from one of our, our YouTube friends, actually, uh, whose name I'm frantically trying to find here now. Oh, and I can't find it. So I'm going to have to go onto YouTube page. So while I do that, um, we should also give a little shout out to Josh, um, who was once again on with myself and Ross last night on the English Breakfast Pod. So if you haven't heard that, do give that a listen um, because he's uh, he's becoming a bit more of a regular with us and he, he seems to enjoy it. So thank you very much for joining us, Josh. I want to give a shout out to Ahmed Saeed. Um, who's another one of our, our regular listeners and regular contributors. Uh, Ahmed was, um, have, I think, having a chat, and he came up with a hashtag of Ask Drew this week, which is uh, uh, marvellous. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. It's in, in relation to your Bundesliga knowledge, Drew, of course. Nothing else. Yeah, but, uh, yeah and uh, oh, the person I wanted to give a shout-out to uh, as I load YouTube, uh, Jeevnesh Shah. Um, who uh, put a nice comment on our podcast last night on YouTube saying uh, it's another great podcast. I'm waiting for Monday just because of you guys. So that's really kind and uh, nice to hear. If you don't already know, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, on SoundCloud or on iTunes. few people were having some issues with iTunes last week. I think that was my fault. Sorry about that. Should be all fixed now. Uh, Everybody else, um, you can get onto those and feel free. Leave us a comment. Leave us some feedback. um, Tweet us. Whatever you'd like to do. We appreciate the feedback um, very, very much. So thank you all 
thanks very kindly for your comments uh we'll be back next week um i should also say at this point uh, mr mark j fine keep on running sir keep on running you keep sending your updates we'll keep favoriting them so keep that running up uh but thank you very much to my panelists for joining us uh tonight so thank you to john and to drew no worries Drew's run away. He's like, no, I'm done. He's gone. <laughs> he's run for the hills. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he has. He's run away. Um, and of course, thanks. No, to I'm there. here. Sorry. Oh, you're there. He's back. He's doing some writing. Really inopportune phone call. <laughs> and I oh, I want to let you off. Um, and of course, uh, our thanks to Tom as well. You could be with us this evening um, and to all the crew as usual, uh, except for Gaz. Uh, again, no credit to you <laughs> at all. Uh, only joking. Right. So we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for choosing the Football Hipsters for your place for your football enjoyment. We'll be back on the uh, satchel on Thursday. I don't know if John's around. I'll have to try and persuade him in a minute and we'll be back for the english breakfast on sunday and a podcast regular this time next week so until then keep your being strong and your glasses trendy we've been the football hipsters and we'll speak to you very soon